But what kind of world is he living in that he, he has to have this, this on all his food? Well, what's starting to emerge is, is that there are, there are two primary factors for all of us that influence our personal preferences. First is physiological, all right? Physiologically, some people have 500 or less taste buds, which isn't a good or a bad thing. It's just what you have. Right. It's the equipment you have. And as a result, the sensory world you live in looks a certain way. Your experiences and uh, 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 what you can and can't discern. At the other end of the extreme where your son lives, uh, people can have 11,000, even 13,000 taste buds. And they live in a sensory cacophony. They are so acutely aware of sensations. And somebody living in their world, we all think this is how it occurs for everybody. But we know people are colorblind and can't see certain things. And that happens with all of our senses, our hearing, our sight, our smell, our taste. So what we've discovered, this it's, it's an imperative thing to know, and also that there's not a good or a bad. People think, oh, the wine experts must have the most taste buds and so on. It's not at all the case. As a matter of fact, our research shows conclusively the most taste buds, the people with the most taste buds are sweet wine drinkers. And we totally are, are misunderstanding them and disenfranchising them. And we'll get to that later. Your son lives in the world of hypersensitivity, we call it. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this, certain things that, that you may recognize or even may be incapable of recognizing are these horrible, bitter, excruciating experiences for him. So when he has his green vegetables, he's getting this horrible bitterness, much like people get with a compound called prope. Prope is something that hypersensitive tasters very frequently will just get this excruciating, horrible bitterness when you've experienced it, and it's mildly irritating. And then some people are, are physiologically incapable of tasting at all. So the behaviors of the hypersensitive children tend to be, they don't eat their vegetables, uh, they get irritated and distracted, they tend to be hyperactive as well, because they're all these things going on, the littlest sound that might not register for most people is something that they, they look for. So what they do is they've got certain behaviors like using sweetness and salt to mask or to mitigate the bitterness that they are so acutely aware of. And then we end up punishing them so st stop that, go home, and, and this is for everybody out there, if you are a hypersensitive, what we call vino type, uh, then you're the one dumping all this, the salt on your food because you're so acutely aware of bitterness that you need to do the thing that suppresses that. Right. And when people give you a hard time about it, you say, stop that right now, I've got more taste buds, I've got to do this. Yeah. And for your son, uh, I'm guessing he's being punished for having more taste buds in living in this acute sensory world. And that will continue the rest of his life. It's what's wrong with me? How come I don't fit in? And at the table, you sit there, young man, you know. Until you eat your vegetables, right. And where did you learn that? Yeah, from my dad. From your dad. Yeah, so, yeah. We, so this is an opportunity for everybody, for wine drinkers around food and whatever, to step back a second and say, wait a minute, I wonder what's going on for them that they've adopted those behaviors. Right. So, 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 so it's the sugar in the ketchup that is masking the bitterness of the vegetables, perhaps. That's correct. And also the salt. There's a fairly high amount of salt in it as well. Okay. And so because another thing that I've noticed as well since I first heard you talk is, is, is when people put sugar in their espresso coffee, for example. So right. Espresso coffee, you know, where it in France is a standard coffee, um, and a lot of people are putting sugar into it, and it, I guess it's the same thing. Is that right. They have a, a, high, a low tolerance of it, no, high tolerance of bitterness. They've got a low tolerance. They've got a hypersensitivity right. to bitterness. Right. So what we've done is, is uh, we, what we have is what we call venotyping. Your venotype, it's like a phenotype. It's your genetic sensory traits that determines what and at what intensity you experience things. That's sound, that's sight, uh, hearing, uh, taste, smell, and touch. Hyper, hypersensitive uh, venotypes, the most sensitive are what we call sweet. And they can't even tolerate the burn of the alcohol, the horrible bitterness, the 
the tannins of red wine. They drink sweet wine, which always, historically, classically, was okay in France. It's not a Coca-Cola phenomenon. There's, there's so, much, um, so many mistakes we need to clean up and, and wrong assumptions. Uh, in France, you get a glass of wine, and it was too strong. You add a little water, you put a cube of sugar in it, and it's okay. Or you put fruit juice in it, or you put cassis in with the white wine that was too bitter and, and unpleasant. It was always okay. And so somehow we disenfranchise all the sweet people who have been disenfranchised at the table. You sit there, the good kids can go play. And we're, we continue to punish them. Yeah. Now, rosé drinkers are usually in a category of the hypersensitive because they don't want the intensity of the, the bitter, strong red wines. Uh, they may have uh, somehow disassociated to sweet as being childish and bad for you. That's what you're doing to your son. And uh, uh, so hypersensitive, so sweet is the most sensitive. Hypersensitive are very, very sensitive, but they typically choose dry wines. Then when we've got the middle group, which is sensitive, that's kind of where I am. And we're wishy-washy. We, we can go to cream and sugar in our coffee one day and black the next or an espresso. So we've got the widest boundaries. And then what we call the tolerant tasters. The tolerant tasters, black coffee, uh, they can enjoy scotch and cognac. Uh, and they look for lots of flavor because they need more sensory input to be able to, uh, to distinguish it. And is it true to say that, uh, generally speaking, women are more sensitive tasters than men? Yes, and it doesn't mean a better taster, it means different. But the fascinating thing is about 35% of the hypersensitive and of, of, of the sweet venotypes are men. So this whole gen the idea that it's a gender thing completely, it does no more to help the wine industry or to, to, to you know, calm the arguments at the table or over wine and food. There are men, there are women. And it's very, very likely that, uh, that when you have a tolerant and hypersensitive people living together, that they argue over the volume of the TV. They argue over the thermostat setting yeah. and, you know, what wine should we have with tonight's dinner. Right. So it's really great to understand this, uh, and especially in, in context with the kids. One of, a lot of the work that I'm doing now is with my research colleague, Dr. Virginia Udermolin at Cornell University. She's a pediatrician, and about three years ago, I ran across her work uh, with children in their response to Altoid mints and their sensitivity to that burning or cooling. Yeah. And I went, oh my God, she's doing work on the whole personality trait, behavior development and whatever that's completely parallel to the work I was doing with wine and food and wine consumers. So we're doing now consumer research that has an impact for pediatricians to help uh, mothers and families understand this is why Jimmy's behaving the way he is. It's because he lives in this different sensory world. And so, uh, uh, also, you, what was the other epiphany you had around the morning sickness? That, yes, exactly. Yeah. Is the, the fact that um, my wife, when she was pregnant, um, was acutely um, sick, more, had more, really bad morning sickness uh, with Felix, my son, who is now the, uh, the, the, the guy who's in excruciating pain at the dinner table. Because right. Of, and you think there's a... There, there's a it's about a night... If, if you have a hypersensitive male, a really highly sensitive, loading the salt on, can't drink coffee, or has to put a sparkling you know, water, even, or sparkling water. Uh, then uh, it's it's about a 90 plus percent chance that mom had severe morning sickness, and we don't know the mechanism of that. Every time we we kind of <laughs> uh, 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 solve one problem and open the door, oh great, there's 10 new doors to look at. But it seems like that, that the sensitivity of the offspring causes the mother to have the food rejection. That's that way around. And yes, and, and, we, uh, and, and that changed for me about a year ago. I thought it was the mother that then influenced, but it's right. back ass works. <laughs>